These are all the comic arcs adapted for X-Men 97. Hello, you merry mutants. I'm Kyle Anderson, and I'm back on my X-Men bull to talk you through just how many comic storylines we saw come to life in X-Men 97 season one. In only 10 episodes, we got no fewer than 14 different comic arcs on display. It's amazing they all flowed together so nicely. Legitimately, I think X-Men 97 is the best X-Men thing maybe ever. Can I gush more? We'll find out. Anyway, to fully delve into all the comics we saw in the animated series, we're going to need to do a bit of spoiling. So if you haven't yet finished X-Men 97, please make like Cable and return to your war-torn future timeline. Or whatever. I'm so sorry, Mom. Everybody ready? Then let's hit it, bub. There's not enough bubs in this season. The first episode of the season, To Me, My X-Men, doesn't have any major adaptations. It more reflects the status quo of the team following the perceived death of Professor X. It also sets up the season-long arc of the Sentinels and their creator, Bolivar Trask, as major antagonists. The end of the episode shows us Magneto taking over as leader of the X-Men. This is a direct setup to what we see in the second episode, Mutant Liberation Begins. He trades in his familiar pink and purple costume for a different pink and purple costume. No more helmet, no more sleeves, and with a big M on his chest. Slightly less iconic, we have to say. Magneto is put on trial for his anti-human crimes, which echoes what happened in the comics in Uncanny X-Men number 200 from 1985. This monumental issue sees the master of magnetism before a United Nations tribunal, in which he gives an impassioned speech about mutant rights. Those proceedings are interrupted by Fenris, a.k.a. Andrea and Andrea Strucker, the twin children of Nazi psychopath, sidebar, they all were, Baron Von Strucker. While in utero, Arnim Zola injected the Strucker children with X genes, giving them superpowers to benefit fascism. Cool, 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 cool stuff. Another big thing that happens in the issue is Madeline Pryor Summers goes into labor, which happens in the episode as well. The difference here, of course, is that in the comics, we, Cyclops, and Madeline herself know she isn't Jean Grey, but we'll get to that in a second. Now, Fenris doesn't appear in Mutant Liberation Begins, and were instead replaced with the Friends of Humanity, a very human hate group that wants all mutants to die. They think it's a travesty that Magneto be given the dignity of a public trial and make the stance very clear when they attack the UN. The FOH have their own ace in the hole in the form of the vaguely ninja-looking and supremely stupidly named Executioner. x hyphen Cutioner. This guy looks pretty cool and has a lot of different weapons from many different sources, but boy does he ever go out like a chump in the episode. In the comics, the Executioner lasts a lot longer, acting as a kind of assassin who tries to get revenge on all the mutants. His armor and weapons are salvaged alien technology. Though named for the event and appearing first in Uncanny X-Men Annual number 17 from April 1993, Executioner actually has pretty much nothing to do with the massive crossover event Executioner's Song, which encompassed Uncanny X-Men 294 to 297, Adjective Free X-Men 14 through 16, X-Force 16 through 19, X-Factor 84 through 86, plus a one-off about the villain's strife. This ran from November 92 through February 93. So why am I even bringing it up? Well, it has a lot of the era's most integral connective tissue, including loads about Cable, the techno-organic virus, Apocalypse and his horsemen, Mr. Sinister working with Strife to kidnap Scott and Jean. All of this comes into play in X-Men 97. In the episode, Executioner shoots Storm with a gun that removes her mutant powers, which we learn was the work of mutant techno wizard Forge during a dark time in his past. In the comics, this actually predates Magneto's trial taking place in Uncanny X-Men number 185 from 1984. In that story, Henry Gyrich is the one who shoots Storm, and she would go on to be a depowered character for a full three years. That moves us along to episode three, Fire Made Flesh. This is effectively an adaptation of the enormous Marvel wide event Inferno, which ran from October 1988 to August 1989. In it, Madeline Pryor Summers, who we had previously learned was a clone of Jean Grey and who died and was sent to limbo. She makes a deal with the demon Naster to find her son Nathan and kill Mr. Sinister's marauders in exchange for making a bridge between Earth and Limbo. Basically, this is when Maddie becomes the Goblin Queen and she takes over New York, turning everything and tons of the titles in the line into horror-themed nightmares for almost a year. The episode somehow truncates all of this into a single episode, and it's a freaking awesome episode at that. Just staggering. The major changes are, this is the doing of Mr. Sinister instead of a revenge plot against him. Everyone finds out Madeline is a clone of Jean Grey first before she decides on the name Madeline Pryor. And it's Mr. Sinister who infects baby Nathan with the techno-organic virus instead of Apocalypse. That part doesn't happen in Inferno, but rather in the X-Factor arc Endgame, which ran from issues 65 to 68 in 1991. Apocalypse and his machinations about Jean and Scott take up, I'm gonna say, 
Way too much of those years of X Factor. At the end of that arc, Jean and Scott give Nathan to the future warrior Ascani, who takes him to the future where there might be a cure. In the episode, it's Bishop who does this. Goodbye, Bishop. We hardly knew ye. And we definitely hardly knew Nathan. Episode 4 is a split story. The first part of it, Motendo, finds Jubilee and Roberto sucked into a video game and winding up in Moja's dimension. There they meet an older version of Jubilee who in actuality is a computer simulation of Jubilee which Mojo used to test his trials. That character in the credits is named Absissa, who is voiced by Allison Court, who played Jubilee in the 92 cartoon. Also, she was Lunette the Clown in The Big Comfy Couch, but that's neither here nor there. Absissa is a very weird pull, but she appeared in Wolverine Volume 2, Issues 52 and 53, in which Wolverine travels to the Mojoverse. He has a much closer connection to Jubilee in the books than he did in the cartoon. The other part of the episode is called Life Death Part 1, which follows Storm meeting Forge and the latter pledging to help her get her powers back. This directly references and adapts Uncanny X-Men number 186, also called Life Death. Forge and Storm spend enough time together to fall in love, then he tells her it was in fact him who built the gun which took away her powers. This storyline includes Storm battling against a wraith of an owl representing her deepest insecurities, which they call the Adversary. Much of this is included in Life Death 2, issue 198 in the comics, and episode 6 of this season. Episode 5. Who boy, this one remember it, may end up being the standout of the whole season. It depicts what should have been a moment of peace for mutant kind, moving almost en masse to the island of Genosha as a sovereign sanctuary nation. Several of the X-Men, specifically Rogue and Gambit, accompany Magneto there, and he continues to try to seduce Rogue away from her relationship with Gambit. We get a sense in episodes 2, 3, and 5 that Rogue and Magneto had a little something-something before she joined the X-Men when she was still working with Mystique. This is a somewhat reference to Uncanny X-Men 274 from 1991. Magneto and Rogue are on the Savage Land fighting against various mutates and get a little closer than they had been before. The end. In the comics, though Gambit had been around since 1990, he and Rogue never got romantic until around X-Men number 10 in 1992. Naturally, the biggest part of the episode depicts Genosha under attack from the Sentinels and getting all but totally wiped out. This directly adapts the E is for Extinction arc from new X-Men 114 through 116 the first three issues under new creative team Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely in 2001. Magneto dies in this attack. He gets better. The villain behind this genocide is Cassandra Nova, Professor X's twin sister whom he thought he killed in the womb. It's a wild time in the X books, y'all. This is significant because it's the first post-1990 story to be adapted to the TV series. The in-universe future, but the real world past. Woo! At the end of the episode, a time-traveling cable appears briefly just long enough to speak to Madeline Pryor before the attack commences. It's here that Maddie learns Cable is Nathan, her biological son who got sent to the future in episode 2. This revelation is confirmed in the comics in Cable number 6 from October 1993. For context, Cable made his first appearance in the X-Men cartoon in February 1993, meaning nobody even knew Cable was Nathan Summers when they started making the series. Episode 6 is the aforementioned Life Death Part 2, and while it does deal a lot with Storm and her struggles, it surprisingly deals mostly with Charles Xavier. Yeah, he isn't dead, but is instead up in space as the soon-to-be husband and consort of Empress Lalandra of the Shi'ar Empire. This story, which has as Charles possibly renouncing his Earth mutant heritage in favor of being Shi'ar all the way down isn't a direct adaptation of any story. However, the vibes certainly remind us of an arc from Uncanny X-Men 275 through 277, the issues right after the Rogue and Magneto one. These issues are in the prime heyday of Jim Lee's time as artist for Uncanny X-Men and features the heroes going up against Deathbird and dealing with all the great space stuff we love from the X-Men. The extra-large issue 275 has a cover so iconic Hasbro produced an entire action figure line about it. Episode 7, Bright Eyes, has Rogue on the warpath, as she tries to get even with whomever killed all those mutants on Genosha, and specifically Gambit, her true blue. It also introduces the real villain of the season, Bastion, the human son of Master Mold and Nimrod. Coming out of the sky, one long Nifty bot, right? Bastion first appeared in X-Men number 52 from May 1996, but who became the focal point of the 1997 crossover event, Operation Zero Tolerance, which is essentially what the final three and a bit episodes of the season adapted. That story, which encompasses Generation X-27, X-Force 67 through 69, nice. X-Men 65 through 70, Wolverine 115 through 118, Cable 45 through 47, and X-Man issue 30 deals with Bastion and Gyrich using their position within the US government to wipe out mutants in America. Part of this plan includes Prime Sentinels, or humans infected with the techno-organic virus and brought online via Bastion's mental connection to technology. 
it effectively creates an army of zombies with superpowers. Yikes on bikes. Within the three-part finale, called Tolerance is Extinction, we get several more references and adaptations. At the end of part one, Val Cooper releases Magneto from captivity in Sinister's lair, and the Master of Magnetism flies to the North Pole, and he creates a worldwide electromagnetic pulse, shutting off all the prime sentinels, but also killing thousands of humans and mutants alike. It's, it's not the best look for him. This actually happens in X-Men number 25 from 1993, part of the Fatal Attractions arc, which acts as a culmination of the first part of that era that began with Jim Lee and Chris Claremont's X-Men number one. Loads of Fatal Attraction stuff happens in part two and three, including Magneto ripping out Wolverine's adamantium skeleton, the US government enacting the Magneto protocols, and Charles entering Magneto's brain. In that comic, Charles leaves Magneto in a vegetative state, which then leads to Onslaught. Here, Magneto returns to pseudo-goodness, but we don't know if the Onslaught stuff will happen down the road. In part two, Magneto creates a massive space station out of the ground and metal and sh and sends it into orbit. This is Asteroid M, which served as Magneto's base of operations on and off in the comics, beginning all the way back in The X-Men number five from 1964. Magneto attempts to recruit the X-Men to his more militant cause, and very briefly, Rogue and Roberto go with him. This echoes the Acolytes, a group of mutants who believe in Magneto's teachings who first appeared in the aforementioned X-Men number one. Another really fun series of references from part two deals with costumes. Cable gets his second costume, blue and yellow like the X-Men's of the time, which he started wearing in Cable number 15 from 1994. Cyclops, Jean, Storm, and Wolverine all wear their 70s and 80s costumes, which harken back to the Dave Cockrum and John Byrne era of art. These costumes are also immediately recognizable to anyone who played the Konami X-Men stand-up arcade game or saw the failed 1989 animated pilot Pride of the X-Men. The X-Men don't have room for Warney Brights! Just who are you calling Warney? Rogue gets her earliest costume, back when she first appeared, still a baddie working for Mystique. Jubilee's new costume is actually a wild one, as it's her black bodysuit under yellow jacket number she wore in the 2011 series Wolverine and Jubilee. And Roberto wears the black and yellow New Mutants costume. In the final episode of the season, after after Bastion jumps into the US's missiles rather than join the X-Men, most of the mutants on the asteroid seemingly die in the blast. This is not the case, we quickly learn. The show gives us many teases for the next season, and in turn many teases to other comic stories they'll likely adapt. Six months after the climax, we see Forge, one of the few who wasn't on the asteroid when it blew, as he tries to account for various members of the team. On the wall of his lab, we see a grid of photos of various heroes. Over many of them, we see a label, Missing Presumed Dead. Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are listed as Off-World, and Cable, Sunspot, and Jubilee are AWOL. This image is, of course, a direct reference to the iconic cover of Days of Future Past from Uncanny X-Men number 141 from 1981. Then Bishop comes in, hey, Bishop's back! And we get a sense that the two of them are going to try to travel in time and find our missing heroes. To do that, they may turn to the people not missing or AWOL. Colossus, Dust, Magic, Iceman, Havoc, Exodus, Shadowcat, and Emma Frost. Forge and Bishop could recruit these mutants for missions, perhaps relaunching X-Factor, or hell, if Cable comes back, it could be X-Force. Not these mutants necessarily, but the idea of the world seeing the X-Men die is very like what happens in the Fall of the Mutants crossover from 1988. Using the fact that the world thinks they're dead, Storm travels with the X-Men to the Australian Outback where they set up a base and run missions in anonymity. Remember, Storm, Wolverine, and Morph appear in neither of the following time-torn sequences. Maybe they grabbed Jubilee and Roberto and said, Aru Naru, and went down under. I'm so sorry. We then cut to Egypt 3000 BC. We learn Rogue, Nightcrawler, Beast, Magneto, and Xavier all ended up back then. As they defend some people against Anubis-headed warriors, they meet someone standing against them. He says his name is En Sabanur, AKA Apocalypse. So wait, in episode two, when Wolverine says, He's, he's here. <laughs> Apocalypse. The baby. It wasn't a joke, he was absolutely right. Wild. This is very likely to be an adaptation of the Rise of Apocalypse miniseries from 1996, which sees the near immortal mutants days in Egypt during a time in which the empire was ruled by Pharaoh Ramatut, AKA Kang the Conqueror. Looks like Kang watches back on the menu, boys. 
This then cuts to a thousand years in the show's future where Cyclops and Jean arrive and meet Mother Ascani and see a young Nathan. Mother Ascani is or will be Rachel Summers, Scott and Jean's daughter from the Days of Future Past timeline. This part will likely adapt the Adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix miniseries from 1994, wherein Rachel brings her parents forward in time and we see an Earth where Apocalypse rules. In this future, they have the opportunity to raise Nathan, but not before they learn that Rachel and the Ascani tried to cure him by cloning him and testing treatments on him. This gave us the supervillain Strife, evil clone of Cable. Who boy! And that's not all! Back in present-day Genosha, we see the hooded visage of Apocalypse lamenting the loss of so many mutants, then picking up Gambit's torn playing card, and he says death is coming. This will likely adapt a time in the comics where Gambit really was a horseman of Apocalypse, along with other former X-Men Polaris and Sunfire. This happened following M-Day, which occurred during the House of M event in 2005 when Scarlet Witch said, no more mutants, and made it so only a few hundred mutants existed on Earth and no more could be born. Bleak time! Anyway, Gambit believed Apocalypse could be the true savior of mutant kind and joined willingly. Here it seems like Gambit will be brought back from the dead to be death, but it will likely follow the same formula. So that leaves us with at least three, possibly more, major comics for next season and three separate timelines in which Apocalypse is key. If you were sad he didn't appear in any of the episodes this season, just wait until next season. X-Men 97 is pulling absolutely no punches, and it gives us so much deliciousness to feast upon and so many back issues to read. My shelf is already overflowing. And there you have it, all the major comic arcs we spotted in X-Men 97 Season 1. But tell us, what did you think? Did you catch any that we missed? What was the biggest surprise for you? And will we ever see more of Multiple Man's amazing dance moves? Let us know in the comments below, and for more of the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, keep it glued to Nerdist.com, bub.